Come all you young sailormen, listen to me I'll sing you a song of the fish in the sea When it's windy weather, boys, stormy weather Boys, when the wind blows, we're all together Boys, blow ye winds westerly, blow ye winds blow Jolly sou'wester, boys, steady she goes Hello everyone, this is the Commonwealth Realm with the 7th episode of Zelda, known about the bay and ocean province of Zelda Wii U. This time I'm joined by Jess from Game Over Jess, who will help us through this massive episode. A pleasure to be here Conrad, in the Game Awards gameplay demonstration we got a sneak peek to the newest iteration of Hyrule through the gamepad map. Surprisingly, and for the first time since Zelda 2 Adventure of Link, it appears a massive bay and ocean is present and could mark the most extensive single area in the next installment. A return to the series' roots might be imminent, as the southern section of the coastline heavily resembles the coast from the original Legend of Zelda, its most visible landmark being the Gambler's Den, while the areas to the north appear to be introduced for the first time in the series. Truth be told, we all want to both sail the open waters of the sea and ride Epona throughout the seamless open world of Hyrule, and it appears Nintendo might be able to deliver on this ambition this time. However, in order to achieve a living and interesting setting for the sea portions, which again will encourage exploration, one specific group needs to be included in the newest installment, namely pirates. The presence of pirates in the Zelda franchise has been a tradition since their introduction in Majora's Mask, appearing since in seven canon installments. In this term, the most interesting entries have been the strict Gerudo pirates in Majora's Mask, the clumsy but central to the story Tetris pirate crew in Wind Waker, the skeleton pirations in the Oracle games, and finally, the ancient robot pirates from Skyward Sword. Let's begin with the earliest entry in the timeline, the ancient robot pirates, their stronghold, and the sand ship in Skyward Sword Sandsea. Located in the westernmost corner of the Lanaru province, the Sandsea is a complicated case. In present times, it is a non-traversable wasteland, and the only way to cross this area is through activating the ancient time shift stone on board the small cannon boat in the ancient harbor where Link is introduced to Skip, an ancient robot and former captain of the massive sand ship, which hosts Nehru's sacred flame. Skipper tells Link about his story, how he a long time ago was suddenly attacked by robot pirates and thrown overboard from his ship, while the rest of his crew was taken as prisoners. Skervo, the captain of the robot pirate crew, Described as a mechanical maniac by Skipper, is suspected to have turned the ship invisible and has ever since been hiding in the sand sea. The hunt for the missing ship led Link and Skervo on their small cannon boat across the sand sea up to the pirate stronghold, where he means to tell the sand ship is finally found in the pirate bay. With the help of dousing and firing the boat's cannon toward the presumed invisible ship, the pursuit turns to be successful, and the sand ship is finally revealed as the fifth dungeon in Link's quest. Link boards the ship, just to find it completely abandoned after all these years. The pirate crew seem to be long dead, or in this case dysfunctional, and after finding a key, Link confronts Servo, the pirate captain at the ship's bowsprit. Interestingly, it appears the robber pirate somehow was able to stay alive and functional without the help of the timeshift stones through all these years. This might be an indication that the gigantic timeshift monster that appeared in the each reveal of Zelda Wii U could have remained as well functional and awakened after events in Skyward Sword, a possibility that could point at a timeline placement for the game some time after Skyward Sword. After the fearsome battle, where Link first slashes out his two swords, and then makes him fall to his certain doom, Fine notifies Link that she has some admiration for the tenacity the pirate had displayed throughout the years, most likely being witness to the death of his fellow crewmen and staying alone on the ship until Link made a swift end to his endeavor. The pirates in Skyward Sword are obviously not numerous, but the setting and tales serves more than enough to give a shivering feeling that these waters were once dangerous and filled with bloodthirsty and ruthless robber pirates who spread fear and terror in the sand sea from their stronghold. The skeletal pirations in the Oracle games are the only pirates to appear in the Fallen Hero timeline. 
As compensation, they play an important role in the plot, and in contrast to the brutal robot pirates in Skyward Sword, these pirates are willing to cooperate with Link. For instance, in Ocarina of Ages, 400 years have passed since the captain of Pyrishan said goodbye to his love interest, Queen Ambi, and set sail to never return. An event which caused the queen to initiate the construction of a tall tower to serve as a beacon to aid the captain finding his way back to Labrina. There was only one problem. The captain was not lost at sea, but was stuck in the sea of storms with his crew. Through an exchange favor with Link, he was able to obtain the Zora scale and dissipate the whirlpools. In return, Link was granted the Tako Eyeball, an item that was required to cross the sea of none return. In Oracle of Seasons, the captain and his crew are stuck in the pirate's house in the middle of Sabrosia Cemetery after the ship crash landed in the Sam Sea Desert. The pirate captain, however, refused to leave the ship since he had lost his rusty bell, which was given to him from Queen Ambi. Link comes once again to rescue. He finds and repairs the bell, and in a password Link playthrough, the captain and the queen are reunited, though in a bittersweet way. Similarly to the Fallen Hero Timeline branch, pirates have only appeared once in the Child Timeline, namely in the form of the dreaded Garuda pirates in the Great Bay province of Termina in Majuris Mask. These pirates do not joke around, they are both ruthless and brutal. The clearest evidence is the tragic fate of the sea Zora Mikau. First, the Garuda pirates stole his and Lulu's eggs, causing Lulu to lose her voice, and forcing Mikau to retrieve the eggs from the Gerudos by infiltrating their fortress. In his attempt, he is caught by by the pirates, mortally beaten up and ultimately thrown out of the fortress and left to die in excruciating pain. Link finds Maku, heals his soul, and uses the Zora Mask to fulfill his final wish. Infiltrates the pirate's fortress with the help of the hookshot, retrieves the eggs, and ultimately gets them back to the marine research laboratory. In the end, it turns out it was the Skull Kid who had initiated the whole sequence after convincing the pirates that the eggs will lead them to treasure found in the Great Bay Temple, which obviously was false. Pirates have appeared in all of the adult timelines, three canon entries. In Wind Waker, Tetra and her pirate crew are introduced in the beginning of the game and play a central role in the plot from the kidnapping of Link's sister, Errol, by the Helmeric King on Outset Island to the epilogue at the same island and further beyond. Nevertheless, the presence of pirates in Wind Waker are a direct result of the gods flooding of Hyrule, which took place long after the Hero of Chime was sent back to the past. According to Hyrule Historia and the game itself, it was first until the accomplishment of the Hero of Chime faded into legend that the evil once again resurged. You know, who forgets history is often doomed to relive it himself. And rightly so, soon Ganondorf was able to break the sea, launch a surprise attack on the kingdom and enshroud it in darkness. Lacking time and hope, King Daphnis von Hansen Hyrule left it to the gods to save the kingdom and they chose to flood the world. After a selected few were evacuated, among them was the princess and her retainers who took with them a piece of the trifles. As a result of the flooding and the creation of the vast sea, it is highly likely that acts of piracy spread throughout the islands, a fact which is referenced by Tetra when approaching the Forsaken Fortress, a former stronghold of the pirate rivals. The pirate crew in Wind Waker, however, is clumsy but still manage to get their desired bounty for bomb theft and demanding payment for the rescuing the kidnapped girls from the Forsaken Fortress. Tetra herself, however, is less obsessed with profits and even gives Link a head start to Jaboon, one of the guardian spirits and presumed descendant of Jabu Jabu from Ocarina of Time. Another interesting thing in Wind Waker is that the hero himself conducts several acts of piracy during his quest. Among them are raiding lookout towers, submarines, rafts, sinking ships with his cannon, and most importantly, finding and raiding the legendary ghost ship in search for one of the eight rifle shards. In the game's epilogue, after Hyrule vanished, Link joins the pirate crew in search for a new land, and this leads us over to the next direct sequel, Phantom Hourglass. Link, Tetra, and her pirate crew had sailed the sea for several months when they encountered the rumored ghost ship in the waters of the ancient king. No, this is not the ghost ship from Wind Waker. To find out the truth behind the myth, Tetra, or Zelda, boarded the ship only to be kidnapped by the evil life-sucking Dream Balaam. 
Link attempted to rescue her but was sent to the depths of the ocean and ultimately washed onto the beach of Marquet Island, where Link met Oceus, Sela the Fairy, and Captain Linebeck. Linebeck himself is not much of a pirate but is responsible for an act of theft against his former acquaintance and pirate Jolene. As a result, she is constantly on the tail of him, and whenever she has the chance, attacks and ambushes the captain's boat, the SS Linebeck forcing Link at several occasions to fight the pirate who in many ways resembles a Gerudo warrior. However, Jolene is not the only pirate present in the game. On several occasions, Link and Linebeck are ambushed by pirate ships, which must be taken out to avoid the pirate mini-blends boarding the SS Linebeck. After the final battle against Balam where Captain Linebeck finally acted courageous, Link, Tetra, and the pirates continue their journey towards a new continent. The final canon installment in the adult timeline where pirates have appeared was in Spirit Tracks, though this time they had a less central position to the plot. From the original pirate crew, only the old man Nico is still around, and other pirates just stands as a hazard for the hero of trains when crossing the ocean realm. With this, I think we can conclude the pirate timeline. The question though remains whether we will see a return of pirates in the next Zelda game. We know for certain the HD remake of Wind Waker served as part of getting accustomed to developing a HD, seamless, fully open world Zelda title. Only this time, the Chinese classic had to face some fierce competition from another third person sailing and pirate game. A game which in my opinion can be considered an evolution of the sailing and combat found in Wind Waker and should serve as inspiration for a sea province in Zelda Wii U. Let me put this straight. Both Wind Waker and AC4 Black Flag were unconventional and groundbreaking entries in their respective series, with a naval and pirate theme set in a vast open sea environment where you spent most of your time on exploration, ship combat and jumping from island to island. This tie has also been referenced several times by Ubisoft. For instance, in an interview with Game Informer in March 2013, game director Ashraf Ismail stated, From every aspect, from the storytelling, from the visuals, the gameplay, um, we've looked at many different examples. Wind Waker was, a, was you know, a, I love the game personally. Uh, so it was a good example to see, look at pacing, look at how the, the navigation uh, and the number of elements that, that tease the player came about. They got some stuff right, but they got a lot of stuff right. But they got some stuff that I think we, we, we needed to improve on. For example, pacing uh, was an issue. We will return to Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, but first, I believe we need some more information about the area itself. Correct. And to this point, our only source has been the Wii U gamepad map as shown during the gameplay demonstration. We have previously in this video addressed the striking resemblance the coastline on the map shared with the eastern coastline from the original Legend of Zelda, which this animation from Skipchendo clearly indicates. An interesting note is the different shades of water or blue found on the world map. The water sections located within the land portion of the map, such as lakes and rivers, appear to have a different shades of blue from the water sections in the outer sea. Will this indicate that the light blue areas will be areas where Link will be able to swim, and the dark blue areas will require an alternative mean of transport to traverse. Another thing is the different locations scattered along the coastline. From the perspective we have seen on the map, we already can point out some specific landmarks and islands. Beginning from the northern edge we have some smaller islands, followed by what appears to be a spiral peninsula that might mark a water-based puzzle. Right below this one we can see a smaller island and another section of land stretching out to the sea. This might be a cliff of some sort. Moving southwards, not much is visible from this zoom level of the map. From the shape of the central bay, it further appears that there could be docks and harbors located in this area, which might indicate the presence of boats, ships, and naval vessels. The lower eastern section of the coastline is more or less an exact recreation of the coastline from the original Legend of Zelda. We have a giant bay area with several peninsulas stretching out from several different locations. From the angle, we cannot see exactly whether there are some specific locations or islands at a closer level. Luckily, this is a section where we have close-up of the map, and from this zoom level we can clearly see the presence of at least one smaller island with the bay. But more importantly, we can see specific structures. In the lower right corner is a structure which suspiciously resembles a dock or a smaller harbor. 
Could this indicate that we will have access to a ship or a boat in the game? Most certainly, but I would like to bring up the considerable in size island in the southeasternmost corner of the map. As it appears, this island might be the location for the dungeon in the area, or it could be based on the small heart container island in the original Legend of Zelda, Crescent Island from Oracle of Ages, or Crescent Moon Island from Wind Wave. Even so, the sea portion of the game might be even more extensive than what we have seen to this point on the map, since there are land and water sections in both edges of the world which are literally cut off in an unnatural habit. In the south, a lengthy section of the peninsula, the river delta leading up from Lake Hylia, and the section of the sea appears to have been artificially cut off from the visible map. In the northwest, the case is even more compelling as there is visible a tiny section of water, which I believe is a part of a sea. Not enough with that, this is the sea which might connect southern Hyrule with northern Hyrule, an area which has not appeared in the series since Zelda 2 Adventure of Link. If this is the case, then the sea and land portions of the overworld in Zelda Wii U might be close up to twice the size of what is visible on the gamepad map. The advanced weather effects in Zelda U should include water spouts, sea storms, and thunders, causing rogue waves and most importantly have a well-crafted wind system based on currents. The question in this regard is whether we will see a return of the Wind Waker, which origins according to Hyrule Historia stretches back to ancient times and could therefore be implemented in the game. We already know about the return of the Sailcloth, but an item likely to return in the Sea Province is the Water Bomb. In Twilight Princess, the water bomb served for blowing up and opening paths underwater. If diving in the sea will be possible in the game through either the implementation of the Zora tunic, the iron boots, or some other device which will make diving possible in the sea. The reason for bringing this up is in Assassin's Creed 4, Black Flag, you had a diving bell at your disposal to search for sunken vessels and treasure. It will be interesting to see whether a similar mechanic will be implemented in Zelda Wii U. Other obvious water-based items which might be utilized or be found in the area could be bottles, ropes, fishing rods, and harpoons. A great sea in Zelda Ryu will most probably require alternative means for traversing the deep waters, and specifically to the island at the bottom corner of the map. Throughout the series, there have been examples of several vehicles to cross lengthy sections such as the raft, rowboats, canoes, the king of red lines, SS Lineback, and the timeshift boat. Nevertheless, the by far best way to traverse open sea sections was through sailing the King of Red Lions in Wind Waker. In the HD remake, the swift sail was added and fixed all the issues related to traveling speed by sp simply double tapping the A button to change your current speed. Another advantage in this game in terms of navigation was the free roam camera that gave a solid perspective of your surroundings. In this regard, Wind Waker's free roam camera controls in the sailing portions heavily resemble and must have served as inspiration for Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag sailing controls. And similarly to Wind Waker, in Black Flag, for the majority the majority of the game you are sailing your own boat. The movement controls are almost identical. You can circle around the ship with the camera, adjust your speed from slow, fast to travel, and the combat mechanics are as well as simplistic. In this case, I believe that Zelda Wii U should borrow some elements from both Wind Waker and Black Flag, and serve as a sort of middle ground between those two games. With sea sections as vast as the ones visible on the gamepad, stormy and windy weather, and hidden secrets scattered around, proper navigation will become a crucial necessity. From the gamepad we know that we have a compass on our disposal, and a seamless map. Wind Waker had a massive sea chart, which had to be filled one section at a time by an incredibly greedy fish. The only fitting comparison in this case of the Wii U gamepad would be Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, where you had a close-up on the gamepad with locations of treasure charts marked on the displayed map. The only difference here was that you could see land masses and islands marked clearly on the map from the beginning of the game. In other words, you did not need help from others to help fill them out for you. A similar division to the one found in Black Flag seems to have been implemented in Zelda Wii U. No major land masses are hidden from the map, which will make navigation through this open world much more enjoyable. 
There are two more things I believe Zelda Wii U should borrow from Wind Waker HD and Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag. The first one is the telescope found in Wind Waker, which allowed you to see objects from a long distance. However, I believe Zelda Wii U's binocular, visible at the Game Awards, should function similarly to the one implemented in Black Flag, since this one did not only allow you to see ships from longer distances, but also scan the level of strength that would be difficulty level and the goods found on board. The other things are sea-based lookout towers, similar to those found in Wind Waker and those presented at the Game Awards. Alternatively, could substitute the lookout towers along the coast with lighthouses, which will serve as guideposts beside the beacons you can set through the binacular. Wind Waker's naval combat mechanic was rather limited and clunky through the cannon, which could easily run out of ammo and the ships you sank did not even follow you outside the small perimeter they could be found. In this case, I much more enjoyed the naval combat mechanic found in Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, and I believe Zelda Wii U should in a large extent borrow from the two-phase combat system from this game. The first phase being scouting out the ship through a binacular to scan the rate of the ship and level of strength, and then followed by ambushing for either firing your cannons or mortars. At this point, a damage meter appears over the ship, which will deplete when hitting with cannon shots, mortars, and specifically targeting the ship's weak points to inflict damage. You could say the damage meter for ships in AC4 Black Flag functions in a similar fashion to the health meter found over the enemies in Zelda Wii U. Precise or more powerful strikes will cause greater level of damage. When the meter is nearly depleted, you could either sink the ship, or get over to the next phase of battle, boarding. In this phase, you first use your fire gun to take out the enemies prior to boarding the ship where you are involved in sword fights, similar to those found in Peter Pan, which by the way, has been confirmed by Mr. Shigeru Miyamoto to have been the original motive behind Link's design. The sword fight consists of specific objectives in order to take over the ship and its contents. These can vary from taking out the ship's captain, officers, and a given number of crew members, blowing up explosive barrels or simply climbing up to the top of the ship's mast and slice off its flag. A mechanic similar to the one presented above could function in Zelda Wii U. As long as you replace the Englishmen in Spanish with the Bokoblin pirates and robot pirates, and where you drop convoluted objectives for a more involving sword fight on deck against pirates. The objective should simply be, kill all the pirates on deck to reveal the hidden chest. A similar mechanic to this was found in Wind Waker submarines and watchtowers. You simply got on the deck, killed all the enemies within or on the platform, and were granted access to the treasure chest. It is long overdue to bring some new and engaging naval combat mechanics to Zelda Wii U, but at the same time, the game should as well bring in several different types of ships, ranging from small rafts and rowboats to larger sailing ships. In Black Flag, there were in total seven different types of ships. Let's say we exclude the two or three largest ship classes found in that game uh, in Zelda Wii U, and we might be able to add a greater variety of naval battles in the game. Another type of activities found in Wind Waker and Black Flag were taking out the naval forts. In Wind Waker, this worked through infiltrating the stronghold and defeating all the ships within it to be granted rewards in the form of rupees and other prizes. This hasn't Creed 4, on the other hand, taking a fort unveiled hidden locations, side quests and activities within that specific province. A final thing we have to note is if Zelda Wii U will consist of sailing sections, then it might include customization and upgrade options to the ship, just like the ones found in Phantom Hourglass. In that game you could acquire several different ship parts from dungeons, the bottom of the sea, or by purchase. These upgrades increase the defensive and attacking powers of the SS9 Perhaps an upgrade system partially based on this one and the one found in the AC4 Black Flag where you upgrade the ship for the many harbour masters or on board the main ship could find its way into Zelda Wii U. In Black Flag for instance, ship upgrades were completely necessary to take on the boss battles in this game, the beasts known as the legendary ships. Every adventure must begin somewhere, and in order to be able to sail the vast ocean province of the overworld in Zelda Wii U, 
We will need several docks and harbor towns, or villages, in several locations similar to those found in Wind Waker and Phantom Hourglass. A natural division here could be the Helian Harbor Towns, and a fishing village, the Zora Village, or a hall similar to the one found in Majora's Mask. A pirate village, combined with several strongholds, forts, villages, similar to what we found in Wind Waker, and Black Flag. The town villages and hideouts should differ to give a player a fresh and unique experience when entering a new town or village for the first time. Wind Waker managed to achieve this, and even more. Black Flag, which created several of the colonial and pirate towns and villages from the 18th century Caribbean. In terms of size, the towns and villages should be a comparable measure to the smaller towns and villages found in Black Flag, and likewise to these offer a diverse and wide selection of activities and side quests, taking place both within the town and out in the open sea. What is this magnificent muzzle you've cultivated? Why fly a black flag when a black beard will do? One of the biggest Zelda Wii U questions is related to what races will be present in the different provinces. We have pretty much proven our point in this video that we will likely see the return of pirates in uh, the province, but what about other groups or races? Hylians and Zoris are obvious candidates, but I would like to see a little twist. Since in Oracle of Ages we had two types of Zoris, the hus hospitable Sea Zoris and the vicious River Zoris. Could it be that Zelda Wii U with both land and sea portions will include both of the Zoro types? Or will the Zoras at all be present since they have a rather odd history of evolution? Depending on the timeline placement we might see the Zoras, Perillo, the Rito or a completely new form of Zora evolution. It will be interesting to see what Nintendo AD3 comes up with in this regard. At the same time, we should not forget the ancient robots and the Gerudos. The Gerudos are mostly known as the Desert Tribe, but in Majora's Mask they took on the role as the terror of Great Bay. There is a slim possibility they might be present in the Sea Province, but with the Desert Province it is likely that the Gerudos will not be a part of this area. Though I would love to board their ships for some intense and challenging sword fights. The final race, or more precisely machine that could appear in this province, are the ancient robot pirates from Scarlet Sword. There are several indications that the robots could have been repaired on a large scale following the events of the game, and from the E3 reveal it appears that the timeshift robots might return in Zelda Wii U, which again could pave the way for the return of the robot pirates in the Ocean Province. The ocean sections of Zelda Wii U's overworld make a new realm of possibilities when it comes to sea-based enemies and animals. And though the variety of enemies in these areas are already impressive within the series, then I believe that Nintendo EAD 3 has the potential with this game to redeem the nearly complete lack of sea animals and enemies in Wind Waker, a game which is overworld was based entirely on a gigantic body of water. Specifically, when it comes to the console installments, the lack of sea-based wildlife has been limited to sharks and octopuses, but the Zelda Wii U's great emphasis on wildlife, I see that it is likely several new additions will be included and scattered around the entire sea area. These could be whales, orcas, dolphins, turtles, seals, jellyfish, and several types of saltwater fish that you'll be able to hunt or fish after. Fuck you, Anna! And the fuck you, dolphin! In terms of enemies, I hope for the inclusion of some creative ocean monsters, which could serve as a natural hazards and mini bosses in a similar way to the battles against the big octos in Wind Waker. I also hope sharks will return as enemies in this game. The same can be said about the sea hats, skullfish, shell blades, and water spikes. Finding the dungeon within the ocean province could turn into a puzzle in Zelda Wii U. The potential locations could be on an island, within a ship, under an island, at the bottom of the ocean, rise up from the ocean, just like the Tower of Gods, or even be located within one of Jabu Jabu's relatives' bellies. The variety of water-based dungeons in Zelda games has been immense, and if there is one keyword for what the dungeon in the ocean should strive for, then it would be innovation. To illustrate more specifically what I have in mind, then take Wind Waker's Tower of Gods. In this case, you were dependent of the King of Red Lions to progress in the first section of the dungeon. Zelda Wii U with its hardware capabilities could expand on this mechanic and make it so that the entire dungeon will be filled with water, and the only way to get through will be by navigating a ship from chamber to chamber, blowing up cracked walls, opening doors, taking out enemy ships, and so on. 
This implementation could lay the basis for several new and unconventional puzzles that will shake the common belief on water dungeons. And another implementation from the Tower of Gods was the Command Melody, where you took control over the highly technologically advanced statues and moved them around. Perhaps we will see a return of this mechanic in these types of puzzles in Zelda Wii U. On top of that, it could also lead up to an intensive boss fight where you first will have to use your ship to chase after the boss in the ocean, and then bombard it, followed by a change of pattern for each of the boss's different forms will require the use of different types of items to take down the boss. This structure will force the player to think and adapt as to how to logically solve this boss puzzle. The best way to describe the base sea of Zelda Wii U would be an endless ocean of possibilities in the vast section of the overworld map. It marks the possibility of continuing the pirate tradition within the Zelda franchise with a much more extensive and engaging implementations, which could end up including massive naval battles and sword fights on the ship deck for the first time in the series. From a sailing mechanic, which simply must return from Wind Waker and further evolve based on the improvements conducted in Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, to the several missing sections from the map indicating additional sea portions in the game, and even a potential return of Northern Hyrule. After 28 years' absence from the series, the Ocean Province in Zed Wii U can only be described as majestic. It has been a pleasure to have you here, Jess. For the next episode of Zelda Unknown, I will give you the following choice. Do you prefer me to cover Zora's Domain, or do you wish for a more extensive remake of the Snow Peak episode? Write down your answer in the comment section below before Wednesday, April 15th. Also, don't forget to like, share, comment, and if you do not want to miss any future episodes of Zelda Unknown, then subscribe to the Commonwealth Realm. To see the second part of this episode, click this link to check out Jess's channel, Game Over Jess, where we analyze the different sword, shield, and combat possibilities for Zelda Wii U. Until then, this was the Commonwealth Realm, and I will see you soon.